Hey everybody, I'm really glad you found Suncrest Messages. I do hope you'll take a minute to subscribe to either our podcast or our YouTube channel. And you can also download the Suncrest app. There's great stuff there that goes far beyond these messages. Either way, I hope that the next 30 minutes helps you integrate faith with your life. Enjoy. I'm gonna try to do a little better impression of the Pope than that. Uh, Picture this, conversations with Jesus In advance of this message series, our lead pastor, Greg, invited all of us and and our friends to choose between 16 options, the names of 16 famous people. You and your friends voted and chose three names, three people, all three conversations potentially high on the controversy meter. Jesus and Ellen, same-sex attraction subject was involved. Jesus and Harvey Weinstein, sexual abuse, center stage, and Jesus and Pope Francis, sexual abuse cover-up in the mix. Those are the three that we picked. Sex, sex, sex. What does that tell us about us? You know, I think Sigmund Freud might have a field day psychoanalyzing us. Let's just admit it, we like it when Greg is on the hot seat dealing with sensitive, controversial subjects up here. I think what that's about, that's what that's about. It's fun, right? I confess that I loved it. Week one when Greg was on the hot seat, week two when Greg was on the hot seat. And by the way, if you missed either message, you should absolutely go to the Suncrest app and listen to both. They are outstanding messages. But now it's week three, and it's a little warm up here. Jesus and Pope Francis. Actually, this is a good message for me to tackle. I grew up in a predominantly French Catholic neighborhood on the north side of St. Louis. Been around Catholic people in parishes in St. Louis and Montreal and Orlando my whole life. Still have Psalm 8 um, memorized in Latin. Domine Dominus Naster, quam admirabile in universitera, corneam elevate est. Magnificentia Supercellos. So um, it's, it's a, a part of what I have always experienced in my life. My wife and her family practiced Catholicism in Colombia during her formative years. This is a picture of the Catholic school, the entrance to the school where she grew up, and I got to visit there, and it was cool to see that. Most of her family still attends Catholic Church. Did you know that in many cities around the world, like Medellin or Montreal, The broad perception is that Christian equals Catholic. Church equals Catholic church. There really isn't much else to consider. It's worth noting that there are differences between European Catholicism and American Catholicism and Catholicism in Hispanic nations. Among other things, I would say that the intensity of devotion to church traditions varies substantially. So it's definitely not one size fits all. We should resist stereotyping people in general, and that goes for people of Catholic faith too. Before we go any further, let me just say this. I'm not sure what your expectations are for this message, but here's where I want to lead us. I have prayed that today we will see a couple of things we've never seen before. That we will understand people and dynamics better than we ever have before, and that we will appreciate the heart of Jesus more than ever before, so that, so that we're ready to follow Jesus' lead as we interact with people. Today could make a real difference. For some of us with family and friends who are Catholic in their faith and practice, this message could be extraordinarily helpful. If you expect this message to tear into the Pope, bash the Catholic Church, then you will be disappointed today. But if you are open to how Jesus would have you interact with people, love people who grew up with a Catholic background or with people who are currently devout members of the Catholic Church, for some of us, our parents, our grandparents and such, then today could be really important. And so let's dive in. Two questions to consider. Number one, who is Pope Francis? Who is Pope Francis? 
while 1.3 billion people consider him to be their primary earthly spiritual leader, a religious celebrity of sorts, it matters that we consider him first as a person and then as a famous figure. Pope Francis is a man, and I will do my best to accurately represent who he is and what he stands for. So confession time, pun intended, I have never met Pope Francis. I would love to meet him, but that hasn't happened yet. Uh, I'm also fairly confident Pope Francis is not going to hear a recording of this message. But you should know that I did get to speak with someone who was with the Pope during a visit to South America, and her impressions were helpful as I prepared today's message. What is more, thankfully, Pope Francis has spoken out on key subjects. He is on the record with some of his convictions so that we don't have to guess about about where he is on, on certain fronts. Jorge Mario Bergoglio was born and raised in Buenos Aires, Argentina. His father was an accountant. His family was not particularly wealthy. He suffered with an infection that required surgically removing half of one of his lungs while he was still a young man. He worked as a chemical technician and a psychology teacher before his ordination as a priest into the Catholic Church. In the decades that followed, he ascended to positions of professor of theology, bishop of Aca, archbishop of Buenos Aires, cardinal, And then in 2013, the white smoke announced the beginning of his papacy. Pope Francis, declared to be the 266th pope, was a first in several regards. First Jesuit pope, first pope from the Americas, first pope from the Southern Hemisphere, first pope from outside of Europe since Gregory III, who reigned in the 8th century. Check out this map. Oh, actually, that's a a chart. Is that what we got? Okay, well, we'll go with this. So of 266 popes, 196 of them, look where they're from. Same place, little little country, Italy. And then their representations, very small throughout, only the one from Argentina, only the one, he's the only one from the Americas, the only one from south of the equator. New territory, diversity, where there's been little to none. He took the name of Francis of Assisi with strategic intent, hoping the tone of his papacy would be supportive of poor and marginalized people groups around the globe. And that hope has been realized to a large extent. He's widely considered to be a pope of the people. Catholics see Pope Francis as being more aware of the way that people live and more down to earth. My neighbor, who is a practicing Catholic, has taken notice Pope Francis does not wear the red shoes, does not use the bulletproof Pope mobile, and does not live in the Vatican's apostolic palace. These are all intentional decisions made by Pope Francis to relate to a large cross-section of people more effectively than his predecessors, to appear more accessible to, uh, than other popes ever had before more accessible to people. During his world visits, Pope Francis walks through crowds and and greets people. He takes the time to do that. Paulita, uh, one of my wife's closest friends, like a baby sister to her, um, Paulita is secretary over economic development for Medellin, a city of over four million people. She works directly for the mayor of Medellin. And when Pope Francis visited Medellin a couple years ago, she was involved in logistics surrounding that visit. Paulita, who is not a devout Catholic, observed that Pope Francis was humble, he was engaging, he was generous with his time greeting people personally. Medellin is like Chicago, two airports. One airport was shut down so that it could host one million people who gathered for a mass together with Pope Francis. When he arrived for this gathering, He spent considerable time just greeting people, walking and greeting people, making his way through the gigantic crowd. At a second venue, much smaller setting, thousands of priests and nuns gathered, and Pope Francis communicated four challenges to them. 
I, I found these interesting, what he had to say. Paulita told us that he said, don't choose your vocation for materialistic or power reasons. Go after the love of God and don't be discouraged by rejection from people. Pursue happiness even under difficult circumstances. And then this was my most, this is my personal favorite as he addressed these priests and nuns. It's a loose translation, but basically he said, don't be grouchy. Don't be grouchy. How many have ever been around a Catholic school or a Catholic church have a grouchy nun story? Yeah, probably everyone, and most of them involve a ruler slamming on a desk or something. Don't be grouchy, he said. As far as I can tell, that's an accurate representation of the kind of person that Pope Francis really is. So here's our second question, and we're going to spend most of our time here. What might Jesus say to Pope Francis? What would Jesus say in a conversation with Pope Francis? If you were here for the last two weekends, you'll remember that Greg described a a possible dialogue, a possible conversation between Jesus and each celebrity. I picture this encounter differently. Unlike Ellen or Harvey, Pope Francis would understand this is Jesus talking to me. This is Jesus. I need to shut up and listen right now. I think he would have a, a clear understanding of that reality. And so it would be a little bit different. Instead of a back and forth conversation, I imagine that it would be more about what Jesus would say. And obviously it's a guess, but I believe that Jesus would bring up at least these three subjects. First, Jesus might say, let's talk about unity. Let's talk about unity. I imagine Jesus saying, Pope Francis, where there is division or quarreling, or prejudicial exclusion in and around my church, it's not okay. And I have noticed that you get that. Way to go. Thank you for encouraging my people to pursue unity. Thank you for encouraging my people to include others in love. Unity is actually one of the most important things we could possibly talk about today. That's why it's a recurring theme in my scriptures. And then maybe Jesus would point out some things said in the scriptures. Maybe he would quote Paul, the Apostle Paul. There, there's one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And then maybe Jesus would quote King David. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. And then Jesus might say, do you remember, Francis, when, when I was in the Garden of Gethsemane, staring down the cross, do you remember what I did? And Pope Francis would answer, yes, I remember. You prayed. You prayed with great intensity. And Jesus would say, that's right. And, and looking down through the centuries, I prayed for you. And I prayed for all my followers. Do you remember the words of my prayer? that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them. Francis, thank you for encouraging unity, but you haven't gone far enough. You've advocated for those who struggle with same-sex attraction. You've advocated for the poor and the marginalized. You've spoken up against ethnic prejudice and exclusion. Good. Now let me give you a new vision for unity in my church. And then I believe that Jesus might lean into two definitions for Catholic. The word Catholic is originally from the Greek word meaning about the whole or according to the whole. It is not in the scriptures. The word makes its first profound appearance in the Nicene Creed in 325 AD. That was a long time ago. And back then, it referred to all the followers of Jesus, everyone on the planet who was devoted to Jesus. It referred to the whole invisible church, 
The visible church is those who attend mass or worship services, church attenders. Not everyone who attends church is actually a follower of Jesus. But the whole Catholic invisible church, this was the concept in the Nicene Creed. Today, I don't know, maybe that would be 2.6 billion people. Only God knows the number, and it's changing all the time as followers of Jesus die and as new people come to faith and trust in him. We don't know that number, but Jesus knows that exact number at every moment. And I believe that Jesus would say, my church is so much larger than you imagine, Francis. When you and those who have gone before you use the word Catholic, you mean the Roman Catholic Church. Maybe, I don't know, maybe half of those devoted to me. A mix of visible and invisible. And Francis, here's my heart for unity. Here's my vision for unity. One holy Catholic church open to as many of the 7.7 billion people on the planet right now as will by faith receive my grace and love. My vision is not the splintered mess of divisions and denominations and doctrinal and traditional exclusionary circles and confusing external obstacles. The unity of my followers in contrast to the current state of affairs, would actually encourage billions of people who are right now far from me to come and follow me. It would be beautiful. So Francis, do everything possible to encourage unity in my church. And here's the thing. I believe Jesus would say the same thing to Pope Gregory IV of St. John. I'll wait for a moment while you get it. See, unity matters big time to Jesus. It's at the top of the list for Jesus. And no divisions, no quarreling is a message of primary importance to all of Christ's church. And so I've been thinking this week a lot about, about that, and you should too, this next week. What would Jesus say to you and to me about unity? What should you do about unity? Second, I think Jesus might say to Pope Francis, let's talk about scandals. Let's talk about abuse and cover-up and opulence inside my church. I'm pretty sure Jesus would go there. Here's why I say that. In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Scripture narratives that record what Jesus said and did when he was living on the earth, we can read what Jesus actually said to religious leaders. Jesus had conversations with religious leaders. He talked with them then. And so it's not that difficult to imagine what his conversations might look like, might sound like, with religious leaders now. I don't think it's that difficult to discern. Jesus held religious leaders to high standards. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees in his day did not meet those standards. In fact, Jesus' most scathing remarks were saved for religious leaders. Did you know that? If you can't really imagine Jesus being angry, read Matthew 23 later this afternoon. Those red letters, the red letters are the, the words in some printed Bibles that Jesus says his actual words, those red letters get bright red. Jesus unleashes the hounds on corruption and hypocrisy when it shows up in the lives of religious leaders. Jesus used piercing words calling hypocritical leaders snakes, vipers, tombs full of dead bones, now, it's important to remember that Jesus knew the hearts of men. He wasn't guessing. He wasn't throwing around uncertain accusations. He was naming real hypocrisy. He was naming real corruption. 
And Jesus was stirred to anger because he knew how the wickedness of the religious leaders was influencing people in harmful ways, was hurting people. Listen to the amazing relevance of Jesus' warnings all these years later, what he said then and how relevant it is for now. He says it would be better for you to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around your neck than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. Jesus says, if you hurt a child, if you hurt a child, it will be worse for you than having someone throw you into the ocean with a 300-pound boulder tied around your neck. And then Jesus says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, On the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside, they're full of greed and self-indulgence. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. In other words, Jesus is saying, what you say and what you do keep people out of the church. People stop searching for me when you shut the door in their faces. So last week I I talked with a Catholic mom, mother of six. Only two of her children who are now adults remain Catholic. Four have left the church. One because she sees opulence and greed and she just can't reconcile that. Two because of the abuse and the cover up of sexual abuse, all four because they see hypocrisy, appearing righteous, but inside, hypocrisy and wickedness. There are children all over the world whose lives have been torn to pieces by sexual abuse. Now, let's be clear, Catholic schools and churches do not have a monopoly on sexual abuse. Last week's message described the widespread sexual abuse in Hollywood. So this is not unique And the Catholic Church isn't the only place where sexual abuse gets covered up. During last week's message, Greg called all of us out. If in the office, if in a school, if in our extended family, we remain silent when we know that someone is being hurt, we are responsible person by person. You should know that Suncrest does what schools all across the country do. We require applications and background checks for staff and volunteers who have access to minors. We have security video in classrooms and we secure a police presence on Sunday mornings. We do whatever we can do to make this a safe, secure place. We believe that's just wise leadership. And so, there are conflicting reports on whether Pope Francis has done whatever he can do to make Roman Catholic schools and churches as safe and secure as they can be. I don't know whether he's done what he could do or whether he has saved face in certain situations. Have those who are guilty of hurting people been found out and held accountable? 50%, 80%, 90%? I am not in a position to know. I don't know. But Jesus knows. And I believe that Jesus would absolutely hold Pope Francis accountable for using every ounce of his authority and his influence to reveal blind spots in the organization and to defrock corrupt and abusive leaders, no matter how vested, to change the structures and the systems that have made abuse possible in the first place. Third, and a little more pleasant to talk about. Jesus might say to Pope Francis, let's talk about me. I want to talk about me for a minute. I think Jesus might say, Francis, do you remember what Peter, the one you claim is the first pope, said about access to salvation? Peter was on trial in front of some more corrupt religious leaders when he said these unpopular words. 
Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name, no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. I think Jesus would say, Francis, I am the Redeemer. I am the Savior. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's always been about me. But there's always been simultaneously this institutional inclination to build in layers, layers of access, layers of religion. And Francis, that's not helpful. Who do you pray to? Who do you confess to? Who saves you? That's me. I know you loved your mom, Francis. I loved my mom when I was living on the planet too. But that doesn't mean we need to add another layer. That's not what that means. It's a radical idea, but it's really important. My sheep have direct access to me, the good shepherd. So encourage them to talk with me, to read my scriptures, to pray to me. Speaking of prayer, I believe that's a big part of what most of us should do with what God has been telling us during this message. Can you imagine being in a leadership position where 1.3 billion people are looking to you for guidance? I can't really understand what that's like, so I'm slow to judge. I'm quick to give Pope Francis the benefit of the doubt because he carries a heavy load. And then to varying degrees, so do church leaders all around the world. And so, would you pray for spiritual leaders every day? Would you make this a primary part of your prayer life? Please pray for spiritual leaders. Please pray for Pope Francis. A few days ago, I Googled how to send a prayer to Pope Francis. Supposedly, my email gets translated into a snail mail and delivered to the Vatican. I typed in the prayer, and then at the end, when it asked for my credit card to charge $1.99, I canceled it. So I'm cheap, but I did pray for the Pope and will continue to do so. He may not know about it. Please pray for Pope Gregory, too, all right? Please pray for me. Please pray for Suncrest's staff team, our elders, our coaches, and leaders. Pray for pastors who are starting our new churches all over the country and the world. We need your prayers so that we can be used by God to change lives. So I hope that portions of this message help us with conversations with family and friends and neighbors. But most of all, I hope that through prayer and personal experience, we will grow in our understanding that Jesus is with and for all those who follow him. May division diminish and unity grow in Christ's church as far as it depends on us so the world will know that the Father sent the Son to save us all. Would you pray with me? Father, where we have brought division, we ask forgiveness. Where we have opportunity to bring unity, give us vision to pursue your heart for people. That more and more people will know that you sent Jesus. That billions will find grace and eternal life in him. In his name, amen. Well, I really hope that was helpful for integrating faith with life. Listen, if you're in Northwest Indiana, I'd love to have you join us in person. Head over to suncrest.org and plan your visit.